Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. I'm Lauren Sorkin, the Executive Director of the Global Resilient Cities Network, coming to you here from Singapore. This is our Toolkit for a Resilient Recovery webinar, which is part of the Cities for Resilient Recovery Coalition. We're so glad to have everyone here with us tonight. Uh, the Global Resilient Cities Network has been responding to our cities COVID demands for over six months, supporting any city who came forward to us. And this started with the city of Huangshi, just over an hour and a half away from Wuhan in China. The range of requests that we've received from cities has been very broad. It's not been limited to public health. Cities have asked us questions related to every urban system, from economy to education, from transportation to gender. Some of the requests that sparked our interest were about developing a toolkit for resilient recovery because responses to COVID, like its impacts, don't hit one sector at a time. So we have to take a holistic response. These requests came from a few of our chief resilience officers, namely The Hague, Rotterdam, Paris, Manchester, who were interested in how the tools were used to develop resilience strategies and how these could be used to formulate a plan for resilient recovery. So the toolkit we're going to talk about tonight responds directly to the demand from our network and the broader field. It's been developed with cities, including Boston, Greater Manchester, The Hague, Miami Beach, New York, and Santa Fe, Argentina. As well as helping our cities respond to this crisis, we're determined to support cities in their resilient recovery. So based on international best practice and in close collaboration with Professor Shaw at the University of Manchester, who you're going to hear from shortly, we've articulated a toolkit for resilient recovery which has four activities, assessing and analyzing the current situation, defining a portfolio of action, improving proposals, and deepening learning. We're also very grateful that in preparing this work, we had support from our partners at Arup, the University of Manchester, and Wood. Now, I want to give a few housekeeping notes before I hand over the floor. Um, those who are listening to this webinar, all of you may pose questions in the Q&A function, which you can find at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Um, and we ask that you put all of the questions there and we will select them during the interactive part. Um, finally, it is my pleasure to introduce someone who I've been lucky enough to call uh, a boss, a mentor, and who is also a dear friend. Um, Lizzie is Chief of Staff of the President's Office at the Rockefeller Foundation, um, and she is also a Senior Vice President there. She partners with Raj Shah to lead engagement with the board, help drive strategic direction, and with, works with the senior leadership team to oversee and guide the direction of programs. She previously led the grant making and initiative development for climate and resilience. Prior to joining the Rockefeller Foundation, she spent five years as a vice president of 100 Resilient Cities, um, where we worked together with her and she worked with our member cities directly on redesign of budgets, supports to resilient project implementation, and with many, many of our public and private sector partners to ensure that they could implement uh, their resilience projects. Before that, she spent 20 years in the capital markets with Morgan Stanley, Lehman Brothers, and Barclays, and she has run many different transactions from innovative financing solutions, tax equity, commodities, cat catastrophe funds, you name it, she has tried it. So with that, let me hand over the floor um, to Liz. The floor is yours. Oh, thanks, Lauren. Um, it's, really, it's really, really great to be with all of you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, city leaders and partners. Um, thanks, Lauren, for the incredible introduction. It's really great to be connecting with so many friends and colleagues during these challenging times, um, and I'm glad that you're all safe and here. When the Rockefeller Foundation stepped forward last July to support the network of chief resilience officers around the world, we never imagined that a global pandemic was around the corner and that this pandemic would place cities in the firing line. It's really been incredible to watch city leaders and CROs stepping up 
um, and working on the ground to help respond to and manage this challenge. And I've been really struck um, since I've been in touch with several of you, uh, how you've confronted this problem and this pandemic head on with the urgency and determination and innovation that I know um, resilience thinking brings. And it's been incredibly inspiring to all of us at the foundation. And I, and I personally wanted to thank you um, for all that you're doing to help serve and protect the people and the communities in your cities. Um, during this time, we've also seen government and industry leaders coming together, and we've got the Global Resilient Cities Network to thank, um, and, and Lauren and the team to really thank, as serving as the glue to this community of important practitioners around the globe, and facilitating the learning and best practice exchanges that I know are important to doing the work. Um, at RF, at the foundation, um, our response to this crisis has really been all hands on deck. Um, we've restructured all of our core programs to the reality that this moment brings and that we are ensuring that we're supporting an equitable and a green recovery. Most significant is our pivot in health, um, where we're leveraging the work that we've been doing for decades in public health and really in precision public health focused on mothers and children and really transitioning those efforts and including them in the process, but about focused on scaling and testing, tracing across Africa, Latin America, in, in India and in the US. And so as many of you may be aware, um, we released a comprehensive US focused national COVID-19 testing action plan in April, and then just recently shared an updated version of this plan last week. It's, it's a product um, from leaders in science, industry, uh, academia, government, who all came together to craft a practical and pragmatic action and, and tracing plan um, with clear targets and deadlines to accelerate the testing that we need in the US to more safely reopen workplaces and communities. And so um, in a nutshell, uh, this plan focuses on three pillars. One, launching a 1330 plan to expand testing, build a community healthcare core for testing and contact tracing, and create a data commons and digital plan for the US so that we not only um, respond to the moment today, but start building the architecture for future pandemics and future catastrophes that we know may happen. Um, and I'm proud to say uh, through the work of, of our teams and, and all of our um, collaborators, the US has gone from a million tests when we first started to four and a half million tests a week. And our goal is to achieve 30 million tests a week by the fall through a bunch of radical investments in the, the development and massive scaling and production um, and, and protocols for more rapid screening tests of asymptomatic people and differentiating between screening tests and diagnostic tests. We feel like we need about 25 million of these screening tests a week in addition to 5 million of diagnostic tests when people are in fact sick. And so how does this work work with GRCN and how, does, how are we working together to meet the moment? Um, GRCN was really critical in helping us stand up and develop the testing solutions group. And I think of it a little bit like the online learning communities that we had at 100RC. And so to support our national testing action plan, we brought together a group of testing of cities, states, tribal leaders to make sure that we could understand what was happening on the ground and figure out how we could expand testing and tracing efforts. And, and we heard just like GRCN does, we need a very clear peer network where officials on the front line can share what's working, what's not, and learn openly, honestly, and safely from each other. And, and GRCN has been a real important partner in helping us identify and recruit the cities for this group. And we'll continue to rely on their infrastructure and connections to disseminate the learnings and guidance and knowledge um, beyond the walls of our little community of 30 um, states and cities and communities so that all cities globally can benefit from this investment and in turn also take in all of the learnings that, that you are having um, from your work. So why do cities need tools? Um, something important that I know we, we all hold near and dear. I mean, we, we are experiencing this incredibly um, major public health and economic crisis. Uh, while cities and communities are preparing for shocks around the corner, like hurricane season in the US. And so at the same time, we've also seen people all around the world take to our streets to protest the systemic racial injustice. And 
these knock-on and systemic effects have really highlighted the importance of resilience. And now is a very opportune moment to further integrate resilience into the recovery of the activities of cities so that we can both respond to the moment and ensure that we're building back better and be prepared when similar crises arise in the future. So just like the testing action plan, it's really critical that cities and local governments understand those tangible impacts of the disease in people's lives, such as the knock-on effects of food access, social support needed in vulnerable communities, health outcomes in different ethnic groups, and ensuring that collection of data helps local governments build a more comprehensive picture and take appropriate action. Cities need that swift action to minimize the impacts of COVID-19, no matter what size, geography, or institutional capacity they have. And in order to do that, I don't need to tell you this, but I know it's important to integrate agile and iterative processes that include um, all of the communities and are supported by science and evidence. And so I'm really excited for this toolkit um, that GRCN has developed that provides this simple, clear, and flexible guidance to help cities of all different scales and sizes and help local governments, especially those who don't have as much institutional capacity, develop their own plans based on evidence. So I'm looking forward to hearing from the rest of the GRCN team about how these tools and methodologies that you're all developing um, together and the ways that cities are planning recovery to achieve long-term health and well-being for your communities is, is going to unfold and I look forward to seeing the progress and outcomes of your important work. So thanks Lauren and thanks to your CN team for having me um, and including me in this important conversation. Back to you Lauren. Thanks so much Liz. That was a great introduction and uh, as I'm seeing a number of people have just joined us. We have over 300 people registered for tonight's conversation. If you are just joining, just a reminder that you can pose questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. I'm going to give a brief introduction to our four fantastic uh, panelists that we have tonight. And tonight's conversation is very much representative of the way we work as Global Resilient Cities Network. You're going to hear from cities, you're going to hear from partners, you're going to hear from resilience experts at the national level, um, as well as from our team. So without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Kathy Oldham, who is the Chief Resilience Officer of Greater Manchester. She'll be leading us off tonight. Uh, she heads up Greater Manchester's participation both in GRCN as well as the UN's Making Cities Resilient campaign. Um, and she is a member of the campaign's Global Steering Committee. She was the coordinator of the European Commission funded initiative to create and implement city to city peer review methodology to deliver the Sendai framework on disaster risk reduction. And she led Greater Manchester's input into a number of other resilience projects. Then we're going to hear from Dr. Uma Mahesh Rajasekhar, who is the chair of our Urban Resilience Unit at the National Institute of Urban Affairs in India. He is an urban resilience professional who's been working in the field for over 15 years, developing urban strategies, risk reduction intervention, climate change analysis, hazard modeling, institutional analysis. I really couldn't think of a better person to be talking to us about these tools and how they have potential to scale um, in particular in our very fast growing cities in emerging markets. We're then going to hear from Professor Duncan Shaw, who is the Chair of Operational Research and Critical Systems, Humanitarian and Conflict Response at the University of Manchester. He is the head of the Management Science Group in the Alliance Manchester Business School. He's the co-director as well of the Health Services Research Center, which is based in the school, and he participates in the Humanitarian and Conflict Response Institute, which is based in the School of Arts, Languages, and Cultures. He's previously worked with a number of other schools, um, including Warwick Business School, Aston Business School, and Aston University. Thank you for being with us, Duncan. And then finally, you'll hear from Braulio Moreira, who is our Director of Innovation and Project Development at Global Resilient Cities Network. He is charged with helping our cities and coordinating all of our organization's efforts to nurture tools and processes to integrate resilience in member cities planning and practices, and in particular to help accelerate project preparation um, and really bridge that gap between project concepts and getting projects on the ground moving. Um, he's also a part-time PhD researcher at the University College London and a member of the steering committee 
of UNDR's Making Cities Resilient campaign. So that is the order of our panel for tonight's conversation. And to start it off, I'm going to turn the floor and the screen over to you, Kathy. Thank you very much. Um, Braulio has agreed to drive my slides for me, so um, hopefully we'll, we'll get this working smoothly. But thank you very much for the opportunity um, to be here. And it's a pleasure to welcome everyone virtually to Greater Manchester and to share some of the work that we've been doing. If I just move on to the next slide, I wanted to provide a brief snapshot of Greater Manchester. We're a city region of around 3 million people within the northwest of England. And we're home to a very diverse population which speaks close to 200 different languages. We've got the second largest economy outside of London in the UK, and yet we also contain some of the country's most deprived and poorest neighbourhoods. I've been asked this afternoon to share some of the lessons we've identified through the COVID-19 crisis and how we're planning for recovery. So moving on to the next slide, just to show that Greater Manchester has been seriously impacted by COVID-19. We've got nearly 18,000 people who have tested positive for the disease, but this is likely to be an underestimate of the true spread. And we've got nearly 3,000 people who have died. And moving on to the next slide shows you a timeline for us of COVID-19. So looking back along the timeline, the first political briefing we held on COVID-19 was partway through January as we started to stand up our emergency response structures. And this was about trying to look ahead and prepare for what was to come. The first case in Greater Manchester was at the very beginning of March, with the situation then worsening locally and nationally until we had a national lockdown imposed on the 23rd of March. We're still coming out of this lockdown. We've got a gradual easing of restrictions and a reduction in cases and especially in fatalities. But the situation does continue to shift. We're now focusing on pinpointing outbreaks in particular settings like factories or schools, as well as identifying hotspots in communities where we have reservoirs of the virus and ongoing community transmission. So to turn to the next slide and to turn to resilience, just to say that Greater Manchester has an established resilience team and we've been involved in many aspects of the response as well as the thinking and design work around our future recovery. And this has meant that we've drawn heavily on the resilience toolkit, both conceptual frameworks that underpin resilience thinking and the recognised processes that we have to build resilience. And the next slide shows that it's important to note that we're not coming from a standing start. And so for us, the work we've done previously to embed resilience approaches into every part of the city's systems, to make resilience a recognized strategic priority, has enabled us to have conversations about resilience and recovery more easily than perhaps we may otherwise have managed. But to turn to the next slide and to start to turn to recovery planning, the baseline that we created to inform the work has used one of the tools familiar to many working in resilience. We've used the city resilience framework as a way of exploring those stresses that COVID-19 has amplified. And the city resilience framework has provided a way of thinking both about stresses that need tackling, but also strengths that we can build on. So promoting an asset-based approach to recovery. Just to pick out a couple of stresses, um, they include the needs of older people, especially those with complex needs in shared living arrangements. We've seen the impact of poverty and inequality, especially where multi-generational households live in smaller pre-1919 terraced housing in our inner cities. And we've also seen the impact of variable access to digital technology that many people have, especially as services move online, and yet locations where people might access technology outside of the home, such as libraries, have not, not reopened. 
But the city resilience framework has also enabled us to demonstrate examples of resilience in action, whether that's through the establishment of multi-sector community one-stop shops to support the most vulnerable and at risk, whether it's about the rapid um, building of the Nightingale Hospital, which allowed us to increase our capacity to support those who are unfortunately hospitalised by the virus. Or whether it's in the flexibility of our voluntary and community sector to help those in need, such as through maintaining a network of food banks. Let's turn to the next slide. In reflecting on recovery, we've also been recognising that although year on year, Greater Manchester, and I'm sure this is true of most other cities, experiences numerous shock events from which we do recover. Perhaps once every generation there is a shock which can enable transformation and innovation at scale and which forces the whole of society to relook at its priorities, potentially fundamentally altering the course the city was travelling on. And COVID-19 is arguably one of these generational crises and it's in this context that we're planning our recovery. So to the next slide, we tend to think in Greater Manchester about resilience through three frameworks within which sit many tools. One is the concept of shocks and stresses that I've touched on already. The second is the concept of disaster risk defined by the UN. And that's that disaster risk is a function of the hazard, natural or man-made, the vulnerability and exposure of a population to that hazard. And finally, the coping capacity of the city. And thirdly, that resilience is about joining up different agendas in new ways and across systems. So the tools and methodologies offered by the Global Resilient Cities Network and, and its previously 100 resilient cities have proved invaluable as we've put those three concepts to work and have been finalising a one-year living with COVID recovery and resilience plan. So to do this, we first of all used a community impact assessment tool to identify those most affected by COVID, who are often perhaps more marginalised from decision-making processes, but who need engaging in the drafting of this plan. We've used an impact and opportunity assessment tool to collate all the ideas, learning, proposals and opportunities that have been identified by stakeholders and that have then been funneled down to develop some core areas for action. We've used a variation of the project scan tool first developed by Rotterdam to bring different stakeholders together who wouldn't necessarily come together through business as usual activities. And they've helped us to explore thematic areas or those stresses highlighted and to come up with proposals for tackling them. And then finally, we've used the actions inventory tool to map our plan against the city resilience framework I showed earlier to understand how we're prioritising issues and in which areas of the city we're particularly working to strengthen resilience. So the resulting plan focuses on the major actions that need to be taken over the coming 12 months. So it's a one year plan to help us to start to tackle the inequalities that COVID-19 has laid bare, increase resilience and ultimately build back better. So on the graphic on the slide, the red to green, which I'm sorry is so small, but I promise you it illustrates how the actions that we've identified are being organised around three broad areas. So actions in the red are those where the impact of COVID-19 has been significant and requires ongoing urgent action, such as the fragility of our current social care system looking after older people. In the orange are actions where the impact has caused challenge, but measures are in place that can be built on and improved such as the rehousing and support that we've been able to offer to homeless people. And in the green, it's where the impact has been broadly positive and needs to be mainstreamed or sustained, such as improvements to air quality. So just finally, I'd like to share a few reflections on this process to build the recovery plan. So the tools have really helped. 
as have city to city knowledge exchanges such as this that, that we've been part of. Being able to clearly explain resilience has helped, including the need to take an all risks approach so that we don't build back better only in the face of future pandemics, but we're also thinking about other risks such as climate change. And therefore we're leveraging co-benefits from future investments, but as well as being clear about what we're actually trying to be resilient to. We found promoting the need for a whole of society approach has been important, using an inclusive approach which engages both citizens panels and also includes working across technical silos with multiple partners from different sectors. Being able to work through the resilience frameworks has been helpful to focus our learning for our plan on the stresses that COVID-19 has shone a light on and to promote resilience in the event of future emergencies. So what we're trying to do is to allow business as usual mechanisms to build wider learning from COVID-19 into their strategies and policy areas and to stop this 12 month plan from becoming too large, unwieldy or undeliverable. And lastly, we found it's really important to recognise that this is a first step in a much longer process. The impacts of COVID-19 are ongoing, they're still becoming apparent as we continue to try to contain the disease. But the aim of our plan is to quickly get Greater Manchester to a better place than we were in when we started, ensuring we're resilient enough to live with COVID-19 and that we're in a good place to look to a future beyond COVID-19 where we can achieve our collective ambition to be one of the best places in the world, to grow up, get on and grow old. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, that was a beautiful note to end on. Uh, about the aspirations of Greater Manchester. And I'm looking forward to the q and I see some are already popping up for you there. But in the interest of time, we're going to keep going with the presentations now. And I'm going to turn the floor and the screen over uh, to my friend and colleague, Dr. Uma Mahesh Rajasekhar. Mahesh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Laura. And um, hello, everyone. Just to give you the context of uh, where India stands with respect to uh, the current cases, last week, uh, the country crossed the 1 million mark. And uh, along with that, there have been news of um, the cases spreading to over 23% of the population in Delhi. And uh, these numbers um, are quite high and uh, still the testing for the number of people are going on. While the COVID is, um, have caused quite a lot of um, uh, psychological and also sociological disturbances. Uh, what's more important to note, at least in the Indian scenario, is more than 70% of the cases uh, which have been recorded have been recorded in cities in India. And even within that, the majority of the cases are more in million plus populated cities uh, than in small towns. So this shows that the life as we know, at least in urban areas, and the systems which are providing and catering to us needs to be relooked uh, in light of the current uh, pandemic and disaster. While COVID was happening, there were a lot of other news which came uh, uh, or which were hidden in the background. Currently, the state of Assam is suffering from huge floods and um, even Delhi over the last three days have had extreme monsoon and they are facing a uh, heavy uh, flooding situation in the most uh, high, high density slums. You know, and uh, these people are really vulnerable and right now for them to seek out help and also to socially mobilize is a critical challenge. While these things are happening parallelly, there are also some of the states in India where the number of COVID cases are very close to zero, especially the Himalayan states. So that's, that's a good news, but the states are getting very eager to open up their economy, especially for the Himalayan states. These three or four summer months are their three um, you know, economic generator uh, 
the months where the tourism is quite high and people there is a lot of mobility and uh, many of the businesses also thrive and depend upon these economic factors so as cities in india open up and as states in india open up it's it's very very important to start thinking about how how do we not only look in terms of the current pandemic which we have experienced and experiencing in some of the places but it's also very important to look at uh, a systemic changes which are possible in urban areas many a times we forget to understand cities are a very complex um, cities comprise of complex systems and mechanisms and policies and protocols with multiple departments coming together and working uh, to cater to the basic services so when that that is happening and uh, when we have a situation like covid unlike um, you know other disasters in some cases where socially people do come together here socially people are asked to move away from each other so when government agencies and government departments do try to identify a way out of this not only one critical disaster which is health disaster but looking at other aspects of economic recovery social cohesion and looking at how communities life and livelihood thrive post the pandemic is a very critical question and that cannot be answered by one mayor or one city commissioner it has to be done coercively with other departments and many a times we uh, do go with gut feeling when we are faced with such pandemic and uh, many times we do realize that such immediate reaction may not be an appropriate action therefore we need tools we need systems we need processes to bring people together and think collectively to come up with not a quick fix approach but more of a systemic change this gives us a window of opportunity to not only look in terms of what cities can do over the next one year but in terms of how cities can try over the next two to three decades as we move into uh, um, you know normal city that's where the gscns resilience to recovery tools come in handy because even though many of us are well knowledgeable on city systems and city policies it is bringing that minds together is very uh, you need some kind of a tool or you need some kind of a process to enable that and i see that the resilience recovery tool is one such uh, tool offered by grc and which can pave the way for getting people together and not only looking at a quick fix solution towards the recovery but look at more sustainable solutions in a collaborative fashion all said uh, of course there is a gap and the gap is in the capacity while the tools are going to be an enabling mechanism cities are going to find it difficult to run it by themselves they need a certain amount of handholding and capacity building and we at uh, niua will be glad to support grcn and uh, our urban resilience unit which was constituted two years back with the support of both grcn and rockefeller foundation in addition to it the recently launched climate center for cities at the national institute of urban affairs will be happy to collaborate to take this effort forward lauren thank you over to you Thank you, Mahesh. Thank you for the continued and generous offer of partnership, but also for painting a very clear picture of what the enabling factors are to do this work. Um, taking, taking this forward, I'm going to call on uh, Professor Duncan Shaw to talk to us from Greater Manchester as well. So Duncan, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, just make sure that my slides are visible. All clear. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity to come and talk to you today and uh, welcome back to Manchester. Um, so I've been asked to talk about uh, some actions from COVID-19 and essentially where to start on recovery and where to start on renewal. So these thoughts that we're sharing with you today has been the product of uh, what we've been doing at the university over the last few months. 
So why is recovery from COVID different to other crises? Well, as you will all well know, is the scale, the pace of recovery um, from COVID has been absolutely extraordinary, or the response to COVID has been extraordinary. Um, there have been consequences all throughout society. We have brought vulnerability to everybody's doorstep. And it's been amazing to see how governments have responded to that vulnerability and how the public have responded to that. Because of that widespread impact, we're going to see recovery being um, unlike other sorts of recoveries that we've had. And so today I'm going to talk a lot more about what that recovery might look like and some of the methods that we've been developing um, to start thinking through that in association with GRCN. Um, there are a whole range of different aspects to COVID that we can think of when we're thinking about what recovery will look like. And as you can see on the slide, um, just some aspects that you might want to consider. Some of these are relevant to um, every country and no matter what the response, and some are perhaps more specific to the UK in terms of some of the particular factors that we are experiencing. But in terms of the broad range, um, things like multiple partnerships, I think Cathy's already talked about that, about having very broad strategic partnerships across the areas um, to make sure that you've got those relationships set up. Um, looking at some of the wider political issues that might be challenging and um, and trying to understand what the implications of those will be for recovery. What we know about recovery priorities is that people are starting off looking at outbreak control and trying to understand how outbreaks can be done and can be addressed in the same way as, sorry, at the same time as recovery is trying to think about how we recover at the same time as looking to statutory functions and trying to understand how we can deal with those statutory functions and get them back into being resilient is making sure that we've got um, readiness that, the, that our systems are there and prepared for the next emergency if that happens um, no matter what that is so whether it's a second wave whether it's more localized outbreaks or whether it's other sorts of emergencies that might happen but always remembering that during um, as we live with covid that we're going to have vulnerable people who need support um, in the uk those people are being shielded at home and different sorts of support is needed to be provided by them uh, for them however as people begin to come out of their houses, we're going to see different sorts of needs emerging. Those needs will, um, some of which we will know, some of which will be hidden and we, we are not yet aware of. But as people start coming out of the houses more and more and as lockdown begins to ease across the world, then different needs will be um, evident. Needs for the shielded population, but also for staff and for the people who have had um, or um, had made this response um, to be um, successful across different parts of the world. What we're really thinking about um, in the university is what this means for a new foundation for resilience. So COVID has um, laid bare uh, a lot of um, vulnerabilities in our system and because of that, it's given us an opportunity to see where those vulnerabilities are but also what um, resilience might need to look like moving forward in case we do have second waves of COVID or other emergencies happening. So what do those new foundations actually mean and what do they look like and how do we build them into recovery and renewal? So I've talked about recovery and renewal a bit and I'd like just to define what I mean by these. Um, so in recovery, we're very much talking about short term action to reinstate services, to get ourselves back to being resilient. So this is about learning from COVID, learning about what we have experienced and what the exposed fragilities are and putting in place transactional activities to make ourselves resilient again for the next emergencies I've talked about previously. And then it's about having a bit of time to pause. Because as, as Cathy says, um, response and the pace of response can be addictive. And so it's very easy to carry that right through into, um, into renewal or into other events. And so we're suggesting have time for pause and think about what this renewal looks like. So here renewal is much more ambitious than recovery. It's about long term. It's about understanding what um, the, the population, what the places have been through during COVID and how we can renew 
ourselves following that experience. We know that renewal is very ambitious. So if you think of the UN Strategic Development Goals, it's the, it's the multi-decade um, recovery that we've just been hearing about. But it's about transformational actions and portfolio of actions. And these require broader strategic partnerships um, to be working together to provide um, ambitious renewal outcomes. We know that this will be challenging because um, response will still be ongoing. It's still ongoing, obviously, in, in many, many countries. And recovery will be happening simultaneously to that. So recovery in the UK has um, been, been running for a number of weeks now um, uh, in parallel with response. And we know that renewal will be um, starting to be thought about um, in the same ways and start planning for that. And then execution of that will come shortly thereafter. But it's, if we thought that response was very difficult, and it was, recovery might be equally as complex, it might be more political because of some of the, the huge um, social aspects that we're dealing with and the political nature of those. So I was also asked to talk about where do we start on recovery and renewal. And the next few slides I'm just going to go through quite quickly in terms of we can start with people, partnerships, the intelligence functions that we've got, processes and the toolkits, um, as Bradley was, will be talking about, and starting off with understanding what that ambition actually is. So at the university, we've been talking about the need um, to, to think about recovery, starting off with people and putting people at the centre of recovery. It's, it's very um, often um, that I've walked into meetings and hearing economy put at the centre. And whilst I completely understand that, economy works for the people. It doesn't work for itself. And so by putting people at the centre, then we remember why we're doing all of this. And then thinking about people living in place. And so thinking about infrastructure, thinking about sustainability of the systems and the, the environment. And so thinking about place as well as being very high on the recovery agenda. And then thinking about processes, about the ways in which we work, about the rules and the, the ways in which we allocate resources to support that. But we also know that Recovery will depend on the power that exists within cities, within countries, and the way in which people can leverage that power. So the, the way in which legislation can support that and, um, and all of the power that, um, that key actors have and their ability to leverage that, um, for example, health systems. We also know that partnerships are absolutely key and it's about building sustainable and strategic partnerships with organisations that you need to be working with in order to um, ensure that your decision making and the recovery and renewal can be facilitated effectively. Some of those partnerships will might be above you, depending on where you sit in this hierarchy. But um, if you're in the local government, then it may be with um, subnational levels that's above you, it might be with national government, um, it might be below you with communities, and we've heard about community panels and so forth, um, with individual organisations and supporting them in their own recovery um, in part of creating a sustainable um, economy. But also thinking about people, people as individuals and working through representatives, working through elected officials, or directly contacting the people and getting them to feed into your recovery and renewal planning. But one of the places to start is understanding who these partnerships need to be with and opening those partnerships up and creating um, very strong, positive um, partnerships for this longer term activity, which, uh, which we'll be confronting. Another aspect um, of where to start is thinking about intelligence. And there's lots of work being done on recovery at the moment. And it's about looking outside to see, well, what is that activity and what are other people doing? And so we've um, framed it according to GRCN's framework um, to say that what other countries are doing are very similar to each other. Um, they're obviously all going through uh, a similar um, experience at the moment, um, although different contextual factors, different uh, local factors that are influencing that. But we can see that within um, social justice and well-being, there's a, a great um, focus on the crippling inequalities that exist within our cities and our countries and how do we address that through recovery and renewal. 
looking at economic regeneration, looking at how do we stimulate our specific sectors, sectors that we're particularly interested in, whether it's tourism or manufacturing or, or digital or, or the different aspects that different uh, cities might focus on. Um, looking at infrastructure, looking at um, promoting a green economy, looking at um, the, the ways in which we have to have a new um, experience of infrastructure and transport networks and so forth. And what does that look like in terms of recovery and renewal? And then thinking about governance and leadership and strategy and what tools exist to help us to think through the challenges that we're going to be facing. So another aspect um, that we have in the UK, and I think Cathy's mentioned it as well, is, is focusing on processes and understanding what processes are available. That's why the processes that Braille will be talking about are just so key in terms of providing to cities ways of thinking through the, the challenges that remain and the way in which they want to recover and making sure those recoveries are evidence-based, not just basing it on what other countries are doing, but also thinking very deeply about the embedded of those within local um, societies. We also think that something that people need to think about is their ambition and what is their ambition for this. So whilst it may be that we have created or that an opportunity exists to capitalise on the challenges that, that COVID have presented and and whether this is a, a one in a generation opportunity that, uh, that we have, is what is our ambition to take advantage of that opportunity? And we've been talking about renewal summits as one way of understanding the level of ambition that's, that there is in cities or in countries for that. So here it's about getting these um, powerful, influential people together to understand whether they are willing to drive through change, significant change um, of the level that we see in the UN's SDGs, or whether they're more comfortable with these more transactional um, recovery actions that I talked about a little bit earlier. So we know that renewal is ambitious. Um, it, it requires optimism. It requires all these good words that, um, of enablers that are on the screen. But we also know that it's going to be moderated by what we're calling five tracks of pressure. So the response, the recovery and the renewal all running simultaneously and taking a lot of effort, a lot of time on those but also the national and international politics. And they'll take time away, as we've seen in the UK, but also the, the funding pressures that we'll, be see, that we'll be experiencing as we move out of the response phase and more into recovery. Um, across the world, we'll see the, the, the funding landscape potentially changing quite significantly. So really what we're asking is, what is the thirst for this significant renewal, even if that, um, that opportunity exists? Will it be that people will take advantage of this um, opportunity and really drive for renewal of their cities? Or will it be that renewal will perhaps fizzle out um, and that we will focus on, on re-establishing uh, resilience um, but not maybe taking some of the, the significant steps forward that perhaps um, that perhaps people are, are hoping for um, and maybe deserve. So thank you very much for listening and um, I'd just like to hand back to Lauren but thank you for the opportunity to chat with you. Thank you so much Duncan for a very comprehensive presentation which we're going to be coming back to in the discussion section. Uh, I'm going to now turn the floor over to Braulio, who is really going to take us through this resilient toolkit um, for recovery that has been uh, much anticipated and has been produced with many of your input. So if you are listening in uh, from all of the cities who have taken part in the preparation process, I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you so much. And with that, I want to turn uh, the microphone and the screen over to Braulio. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. In the next 10 minutes, what I'm going to share with you is an overview of how we got to uh, creating this uh, toolkit for resilient recovery. Initially, I'm going to talk about our motivation, why is a uh, our, our, our network of cities working on this. Secondly, our approach, how we, we, we are suggesting cities to go about uh, planning for recovery. And finally, an overview of our tools. So to start with, uh, it is important to consider that uh, the, the city resilience, so, so the resilient cities network is a, a network of cities. It's a city-led network. 
and listening to our chief resilience officers and trying to help them with their, their, to, with their problems and their challenges is our mandate. So in this context, we, uh, our work in, in COVID started with initial questions that came from the city of Huangxi near Wuhan. And as Lauren mentioned before, the, 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 this, the, the team in Huangxi asked about resources. What are the resources that other cities could recommend? One of our first cities that went into lockdown. And as the pandemic progressed, we saw that this question started emerging from more and more cities. And we felt that it was important to start articulating the, those questions. From many cities, we start hearing uh, that the, their questions around how they could start filter and articulating the actions they were taking in order to understand what was the resilience value. In other cases, like in Paris, they were interested on how the tools the city used to create its a resilience strategy could be helpful to plan for, for recovery and renewal. And also a, in, from Belfast, we heard that actually they were very successful in taking very rapid measures to help a, in the process of lockdown. But they started wondering what, what were the activities that actually should not stop and what were the activities that should be paused and uh, that were paused and should start again, but differently. From other cities, for example, Santa Fe in Argentina, we heard that the, 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 the resilience team realized that COVID uh, get, created an opportunity to integrate more resilience into the, the new plans of the city. And also from, uh, particularly from cities in, in the US, we started hearing uh, questions that were very specific around particular themes that the chief resilience officers wanted to explore without a, you know, losing the opportunity to bring more resilience principles. From the, in the case of Boston, which is something that a, a, a dialogue we have had for many years, Boston was, uh, the chief resilience officer in Boston was very interested in understanding how equity could play a role in recovery. In the case of New York City, our CRO asked how infrastructure could be better prepared for future shocks. And in the case of Miami Beach, how our, the, their economy could be more resilient and how the city could learn to make their economy uh, more resilient for future, future shocks. So, the way we, we, we went about this was, of course, listening to our chief resilience officers. They are the main source of knowledge and ideas for our network. But also we started reaching out to our key partners. And in this case, uh, we, we were very lucky to have the University of Manchester and Professor Shaw uh, volunteering to, to, to explore these questions with us, uh, with us in more detail. And we also had the, the support from other partners like uh, Dahlberg Advisors, who helped us to articulate the role, the emerging role of chief resilience officers in emergency response as well as in uh, recovery. Uh, also Wood, uh, an engineering company based in the US, they volunteered to start exploring how the, the tool that they, they developed with, with the Rockefeller Foundation on uh, integrating resilience principles in infrastructure projects could be integrated and could be better shared across the network so that uh, CROs could plan better. And also Arab, a large uh, design and engineering company uh, that works globally, they, they, they approach us trying to help us to articulate these principles and particularly to articulate the learning that will emerge from this, uh, from this emergency. So in all these discussions, we, and by reading important, you know, written references and also a, a other more technical discussions we had, we realized that there were a number of a, important principles and that planning for recovery had to be different from conventional planning. Firstly, a, we had to take into consideration that the evidence base for planning recovery would be changing and would be changing constantly. And the second aspect is that we couldn't think about this crisis as an emergency. There is no uh, snapshot we could work on uh, or on, 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 on that, um, 
there was no basis or I think stable basis that we could work on. So cities had to be prepared to work over dynamic uh, evidence. So what are, the, are then the characteristics of the process? First of all, it's the agility, you know, uh, remembering that because new evidence and new science is, um, is emerging, decisions are necessary and quick decisions are necessary. And that was a characteristic that uh, our approach had to, to capture. Secondly, an iterative approach, recognizing that as Duncan mentioned in his presentation, many cities will go from emergency response to recovery and then back to that process. And finally, it's always the importance of having a reference framework, having very clear faces defined so that civil servants know what to do at specific moments was key. And this is what we try to uh, summarize with uh, our, uh, our four steps. First of all, we, we suggest that cities need to assess. And this is the first step of our toolkit for resilient recovery. Recognizing that in order to take correct measures, in order to, 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 to take, to take the, the right decisions, cities need to understand what is the situation and, and then plan accordingly, which is the second step. But in order to plan, as I said before, we cannot go uh, about in you know, as business as usual. The picture will be changing, so new and emerging and quicker tools were necessary. And the third step is about optimizing. And this is around using the, the crisis as an opportunity, realizing that when we create new ideas to respond and, uh, to the emergency, but more importantly, to uh, recover from the emergency, there is an opportunity to make a difference. There is an opportunity to make those systems more resilient so that the, those are, they are better prepared for future emergencies. And finally, once the, the situation is stable, cities have the opportunity to learn. It is a key element of this process to take stock and, uh, and, 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 and take the advantage of having experienced a terrible and tragic uh, process, but to learn to then being able to take better decisions in the future and plan accordingly. So what our toolkit really uh, shows is that we have been trying to uh, respond or identify tools that actually respond to the specific questions that we received from our cities. And also we recognize that we, a toolkit rather than a, a well-defined process would be something that will help cities. We need to recognize that cities have different capacities and that different across different uh, jurisdictions, they work in different ways. So we have taken in the case of assessing, which is the first stop we recommend, where we have been trying to respond to specific questions, questions around how you know, data can be systematized. And in this case, our suggestions are around creating an impact assessment, which is a widespread practice here in the UK, which is really about how the information is systematized and how the information can be updated real time, hopefully, so that decision makers have the evidence uh, in hand to take the right decisions. A second uh, tool that we felt was useful would be a recovery resilience assessment, which is the, the evolution of one of our, our existing tools that we used in the re re strategy the delivery process in 100 resilient cities, which was more about exploring who was affected and what were the impacts to people. This, uh, this is a question that initially came from Paris and The Hague. And we, by working and, and, and having conversations with those chief resilience officers, we realized that optimizing this tool, making it more practical uh, would be advantageous. And finally, uh, by talking to UN agencies, our partners at UNDRR in various regional offices, as well as the, the Getty Center, uh, their Getty Center in, in South Korea, we realized that a best practice that would help cities to work differently would be very helpful. And this is what we are trying to summarize in the needs assessment. In the case of planning, 
an initial question we, we received was from our chief resilience officer in Rotterdam, who was actually interested in how we can filter the actions, how we can make sense of them, and how we make sure that actually we're integrating resilience value on those uh, actions that are being uh, decided and delivered very quickly by, uh, by the local government. In this case, we modified existing um, existing tools that is called, uh, and we call it recovery action plan, which is that a tool that helps identifying the resilience value, the contribution of a portfolio of project, and 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 helps chief resilience officers to articulate that uh, resilience value. That constitutes, in our perspective, a lens to look at the actions and then better articulate their contribution to the overall resilience of the city. But also we received questions around, okay, so on what basis we can plan if we really want to make the difference? What are those possible scenarios? Uh, this is a question that came initially from Belfast and we, re we, we, we felt that that best practice existed. So our mission here has been to curate those best practices and then start sharing with our network. And finally, we felt that it was really important also to create an opportunity for cities to explore uh, in depth, the, some specific problems. And this is a methodology we uh, previously developed with the cities of Cali in Colombia and Cape Town in South Africa, that is called Collab, which is a workshop-based uh, methodology to really identify innovative solutions for a particularly challenging problem. Uh, the third uh, option is, uh, uh, sorry, the third step is about optimizing. How we can take a uh, the advantage of this moment or this pivotal mo moment in, in our cities to make a difference, to do things differently and really to take into consideration shocks and stresses, for example, in the case of the, the first two. How we can create, uh, our, our idea was how we can create tools that could be rapidly uh, delivered and how we could help chief resilience officers to understand what were the shocks and stresses that were relevant to a particular project and what were key considerations that uh, the project teams could uh, sh sh should take sh should integrate whilst uh, developing projects. This is something our project scan does, which is a tool that was developed uh, four years ago with the cities of Rotterdam and Greater Manchester. Also, we realized that a, an opportunity framing tool would be very useful. This is work that we are taking from previous grantees from the Rockefeller Foundation who created a tool called Resilience uh, Value Realization, which is a very interesting tool to rapidly develop a really good idea. This is a tool we tested previously with Montevideo, Buenos Aires, Santa Fe and Norfolk in, in the United States. And finally, uh, as I mentioned before, our partners, partners at Wood uh, helped us to understand the relevance of the urban resilience screen and how this would help uh, uh, cities to develop better infrastructure projects and ensure that these large investments also integrate resilience value in their proposals and in their process. And finally, I think one key uh, step that is present in most frameworks internationally, particularly those promoted in the UN system, as well as a, you know, in, 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 in academic circles, is around taking the, 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 I think it's about learning, and it's around using the advantageous point that the experience brings, and actually it, taking the time to learn and actually uh, write down those lessons and really think about how we can, how cities can do things differently. It, to guide this process, we, uh, with Arab, we will be partnering to develop uh, thematic guidelines based on qualitative uh, information as well as suggested KPIs that will help uh, cities to go very deeply in, in a topic and really think innovatively about these emerging challenges, such as the economy, which is a conversation we're having with Santa Fe in Argentina, as well as uh, Miami Beach in the United States. Also, how we can rethink our infrastructure. As I said before, New York City was very uh, keen on trying to explore uh, this problem, as well as 
equity, which is a, not only a problem and a challenge in Boston, but I would say it's a worldwide. So these are the key components of, of this tool, uh, this toolkit. And just to conclude, I feel that it's really important uh, for those participating uh, in here that we're open for partnerships. We're open for these toolkits to be used outside our, our network. But in order to do this, we, we need more collaborations, which is something that, as Duncan mentioned, is key at this moment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Braulio. And uh, as we move to the Q&A section, I'm going to ask if all of our panelists can turn back their, their cameras and uh, their microphones so that they're ready to answer the questions. The, the first question that we have is actually quite a practical one. Um, and it's, it's for Kathy in the view of the City Resilience Framework, um, but I would also open it um, to you, Braulio, on um, some of the specific other rapid assessments. You mentioned uh, the factor of time. So, so the question for, for you, Kathy, was um, specifically with the use of the City Resilience Framework, how did you use it in the city and how much time and resources did you need to support the process? And this is a question that comes to us from um, Irene Cloutier from, from Montreal. Um, and Bradley, if, if you could um, follow that and add for some of these initial stage assessments, those rapid uh, uh, assessments at the beginning to look at what's happening. How much time would that take and how would uh, different cities set up to resource that? Okay, I've got, I've got several answers to this. So um, the first one is that I think um, you can use that framework in lots of different ways. So we've, first of all, it's a conceptual framework. It enables us to really organize our thinking about resilience and enables us to consider each of the areas, each of the systems in the city that, um, need to have resilience and you can use it in quite a, a qualitative way in a sort of workshop scenario um, just where do we think we are on this um, we also um, and this is where the, the detail i'll have to supply later but we've got some people sort of technically trained if you like to do some mapping against it so a little bit more of identifying proposed actions mapping them in as either main drivers or, or as a secondary action against the different areas. And so producing um, more of um, a, a more quantitative um, mapping, if you like, of um, actions against the framework. Um, and then I guess at the very technical end of things, um, but where we haven't gone is when it's slightly different but converts itself into the City Resilience Index. So at that point, there's a whole series of, of questions that can be asked that can help map yourself within that type of framework. We haven't gone there this time, um, but the, the sorts of questions that are asked within that can also promote thinking. Um, the actual bit about mapping specific actions against a tool, I'd have to bring in one of the, the more technical people on my team to answer, um, but we have gone to that level this time. Um, thanks, Cathy. In, in my perspective, I would say in it, the city resilience framework is integrated throughout the four steps uh, that we are suggesting. In each of these steps, we our tools uh, integrate, or there is at least one of the tools that integrates the city resilience framework. Because what the framework is, is really a, a list of actions, a list of outcomes, that a city needs to take into consideration to work towards resilience. So this is a framework that is applicable not only for assessing where our uh, where a city is, but also to plan action and also importantly to optimize. So in this case, and, and, and of course to learn, in the case of our toolkit, 
our recovery resilience assessment is a tool that integrates and has its this framework as its core and uses the framework to map not only the actions that the city is taking, but also the perceptions. What are the stakeholders saying? What really is helping people on the ground? Uh, in the case of planning, our recovery action plan is a tool to map those actions that are already in the city's portfolio against the framework in order to help uh, chief resilience officers to identify gaps or issues that you know might have not been considered or issues that you know are attracting too much uh, uh, investment in the case of the optimizing uh, step uh, the project scan is something that truly integrates uh, this framework for resilience and also integrates the notion of shocks and stresses which is something that makes it particularly relevant for a uh, for the, for the project scale. And finally, learning, it's really about going very deep in each of these 12 uh, drivers uh, of resilience. So what we will be created is guidance that is associated uh, to each of these themes. So as Ka Kathy said, the critical question is what you want to do and then how much time you have. I think at the moment, because some cities might be responding to an emergency whilst others are, uh, already planning next steps, the, the pace of those processes are very different. So ultimately it is really about setting your own limits, realizing what resources and times you have in hand, and particularly what people you have to, and you can collaborate with, and then set off for the task. Thank you both. There have been a number of questions, so I just wanna say out loud, all of the presentations, so long as our presenters consent, will be shared via the Cities for Resilient Recovery website, um, which is a website that we have temporarily as we prepare the new uh, Resilient Cities website that takes the place of the old 100 Resilient Cities website. And we'll have many of these tools um, available as well as all of the new resources that have been produced um, in the last year. So. Don't worry, these will be coming to you if you've signed in and if you're on this webinar, we will send a follow-up message with a link to the materials. Uh, so those will be available. Um, just as we uh, transition to the, the next set of questions, there's a number of questions coming in very quickly now. Um, in terms of uh, guidance and follow-up, Bralio, there are a number of questions from cities about how they keep connected to this community and whether there will be some continuing conversation and advisory about applying the tools. Thank you, thank you for the question. I think it's, it's really important. So we, back in May, uh, Lauren was very keen actually on us developing a, a qu very quickly a website to enable this conversation. So our website that is resiliencecitiesnetwork.org takes you directly in this, uh, at this moment to all the, you know, our actions and response to COVID. And, to, and in the section of tools and resources, there is the, the, the place where you can actually join our community for resilient recovery. Uh, as Lauren said, uh, once we have your information, we will follow up with you. There is also an, an opportunity for you to be very uh, to be very clear, if you wish, around which tools you're most interested in and also uh, where you, you will be applying. For us, uh, our it is really important to be able to develop or to create and build a community of practitioners working with these tools. So. Uh, please be in touch, the, the functionality on the website is there and we will follow up via email and then very quickly, as soon as we can, we will be able to create a, a, a community of practitioners, which is, by the way, supported by the World Bank very generously. Thank you, Braulio. So here's a bit of a question that's also a challenge and, and I wanna open this up um, both to uh, Uba Mahesh and also to Duncan and then come back uh, to Kathy as well, because I think this is something that um, all of us face in efforts to be very inclusive. And this question comes from Matthew Barry. And his question is, how do you approach these frameworks really and, and do them 
justice in a context of future visioning, um, you know, for post-COVID when pre-COVID, there were already processes and strategies in place. And, and I know in particular, Kathy, we had a conversation just before the start of this about how you were on the cusp of releasing, um, uh, or sorry, you had just released the resilience strategy and now there's, there's a need to, to restructure the document. So I, I know that this is something that you were thinking about. So Matthew's question is this, how do you prevent stakeholder fatigue or engagement fatigue? when people have been asked a lot of questions. They've been asked to envision their future. They've just been asked to envision it, say about climate or about a new economy. Um, and now COVID comes. How do we do justice to these tools in, in that context? Um, and, and what do you recommend? And, and Mahesh, I guess an added layer of this is when you're in the heart right, of, of this crisis response, right, as, as India is experiencing now quite, quite a high number of cases. How, how do you balance that and how do you manage the timing and the rollout of, of tools in a meaningful way? Thank you, Lauren. Um, regarding the first part of the question in terms of uh, stakeholder fatigue, um, I'm, I'm more and more realizing at least with respect to uh, the Indian cities um, where uh, we are having a lot of webinars which are organized by NIUA and usually uh, some of them are beneficial to a certain segment of uh, our stakeholders, especially when we talk about the ULB, urban liberty bodies, and uh, different range of actors who are working within those urban liberty bodies. The advantage uh, we have at NIUA, and probably that may be also applicable to other, um, you know, uh, cities and other such, uh, you know, agencies or CROs who are trying to enable it is to reduce the fatigue, you know, and basically they should feel they get something meaningful at the end of the day. And also sometimes the engagement doesn't need to be two or three day workshop as it used to be earlier. It is just 100 people, uh, you know, spending some half an hour or one hour in a collective manner or even in an isolated manner, but a tool which can help bring all those ideas together in a systematic fashion will have the same effect of you engaging with one or two individuals over an extended period of three to five days. You know, and that is where we need to base our uh, strategy as we move forward, you know, rather than engaging the single individual for an extended period of time, we should bring multiple stakeholder and engage them on specific aspects but moderate it or uh, curate it in such a manner that it can be integrated together and the collective uh, you know, thought process is presented in a more meaningful manner. I think the toolkit can also, uh, is one of the way to do that. And uh, I, I see a lot of value uh, as we move along. Answering the second part of uh, your question as India is uh, experiencing um, COVID and we are still not sure whether we have reached the peak uh, um, and, and whether we should also plan for the second wave. You know, we, we are still trying to identify or minimize the daily number of cases uh, which are occurring. Uh, that said, uh, as I indicated earlier, there are some of the states and cities that there are no cases. Actually, there are zero cases, but they are still suffering from the pandemic due to uh, the secondary impacts. You know, say for example, a state is landlocked and uh, they have to, uh, you know, promote tourism, but they can't get the tourists because the tourists have to either come via Delhi or via Mumbai, which is very dangerous, you know, given the current uh, situation. So these cities and these smaller towns and these states can start planning for their recovery in a much more different manner. They can start looking at their environment. They can start looking at, you know, not, not only keeping uh, tourism as a, one of the core forte, but they can also try to look at other secondary sectors which can benefit or uh, improve the life and the livelihood of people. Uh, so I see a lot of value in uh, not waiting for, you know, the peak to occur and the second, uh, you know, second round of uh, uh, cases emerging, 
but there are opportunities already existing in those areas where there are less number of cases, but still people are suffering from the secondary impact of the pandemic. I'll, I'll uh, over to you, Lauren. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mahesh. And I see Duncan was just coming uh, onto the mic. So I'm going to let you jump in there, Duncan, and then. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with Mahesh. Um, I look at this in terms of fatigue in, in three ways. It's first about managing stakeholders. So not about having everybody in every meeting because that way you're going to build fatigue very quickly. So it's about being very careful and strategic as to who you involve in what meetings. But there is also um, an element of democratic legitimacy that needs to be built into the process. So that means that you've got to recognize when you're ha um, looking at major societal change or even organizational change on a smaller level is that there are key people who you need to have there or else you do not have legitimacy to your change initiative and unfortunately sometimes those people will become fatigued because they are central but the tools can help and so the other aspect of this is that we're Fatigue can build, not just from the response effort and the intensity of that, but from the, the use or the, the trying to develop the ideas around what actions might look like. And there's two aspects to that. One is process and content. So being fatigued because you don't know what the process is that you should be following, or because you don't know what the content is. So the actual, um, the actual nature of the decision that needs to be made, not the way in which that decision needs to be made. So these tools from GRCN help to deal with the process fatigue in terms of providing some very clear ways of organizations and people thinking through um, the, the problems that they're confronting. And so they don't need to put a lot of thought into that process but that means that they need to put their effort into thinking about the content. So thinking about um, the aspects of the decisions, the factors that, that impinge on, the, on that, um, the sorts of data that they need um, and, and having that all available so that the content of their decision is able to be made supported by the process um, the processes that GRCN are offering. So I think that the these tools help to stop people starting with a blank piece of paper, which can immediately build fatigue. And it provides that, that beginning place for organizations and people to feel as though they're not starting with that blank sheet. They're starting much further down the line than that. Thank you, Duncan. Kathy, we'll come to you. Um, do you wanna add something specific uh, about your experience now? Just a couple of things. I think we actually found that having already engaged stakeholders in conversations about resilience and where we were going was actually very helpful um, because we weren't starting from um, sort of having to explain all of that to people. And so what we could do is take a lot of the previous conversations and say, how has the experience of COVID-19 changed that? So building on conversations that have already taken place. I think the other thing is everyone has been affected by COVID-19 in one way or another. And so actually we found there was an appetite to want to shape where we're going in the future and a real desire to be engaged. And so perhaps not have the fatigue that we might have experienced in, in other circumstances. I think the third thing that's important for us is um, people are incredibly stretched at the moment and there's a lot of people under a lot of pressure and so they have to know that by engaging in the process it will have impact and so you know we've got strong political engagement and the political oversight of what we're doing and that helps because it means people's input they're inputting into a process that has some legitimacy um, so that they're, they're probably the key things I'd add Lauren Thanks, Kathy. That actually builds very well into what may in, in fact be our, our last question. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to direct this um, to Braulio, uh, but if others want to jump in, please do. This is a question that comes to us from Brittany Brand from Boise State. And her question relates back to sequencing and process because she asks, 
um, if you are a city or a region that doesn't necessarily have a resilient strategy, right, to Kathy's point, doesn't have a baseline of folks who have been thinking together about resilience, where do you start? Um, and to, you know, to Duncan's point about that blank sheet of paper, what is the appropriate place in the process or what tools um, can you bring in? And if I can even complicate that question with a bit of, a, um, I would say, a, a curveball from Augustine uh, from Santa Fe who asks, what are the tools that require the largest or smallest amount of engagement um, from city plus other stakeholders outside, namely business and academia and others. So where do you start and what are the tools that may be most agile in, in that kind of beginning situation? Thanks. Uh, those are really interesting questions and super relevant at the time of, you know, if you're thinking about using a toolkit. I think uh, the way we are trying to address the, 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 the problem or the challenge of where to start uh, is, the, is about training. And this is something that you will find in our website. The, uh, you, the Duncan, very kindly with his team, have created a where to start a training a module, which is available in, in, our, in our YouTube and uh, channel as well as in our website that actually explains, you know, the basics on, on where, where to start, how to organize, what are the initial steps in terms of organizing a group of civil servants in order to be able in a good position to, uh, to, to use tools. And then I think the, after that has happened, after you have decided, Basics as basic aspects in terms of leadership, understood your, your your local regulation. Then the key is to choose and to try to understand where your city is. Uh, is your city responding to an emergency? Normally, when you're responding to an emergency, local policy is what uh, really needs to to be considered the most important task, and then planning activities need to be considered of slightly less importance. But if you're ready to plan, then the idea is, is again, to, to, to understand the situation and try to gather data and try to understand what data is relevant for your particular community and, your, and, and, and even for your particular culture. So we have seen in many, in, in a number of geographies where economic and health indicators are key. Whereas in other uh, places, like for example, The Hague, the key uh, type of data that the CRO wanted to gather initially were perceptions. What is happening to people? What people feel, how people feel more supported. That's a key decision that then, uh, and then, you, then you will be able to find the right tool. Uh, we have made public in our website descriptors of each of the tools. So uh, each of the users can, can take the right decision and we will be there to, to, to support uh, where relevant. Then in, in terms of the second aspect of this, uh, of, of this question, I think, as, as I mentioned before, there is no you know, one fits all uh, approach to delivering tools. And I feel that as in every process, such as you know, being, being that a workshop or being that an entire uh, strategic plan, key factors such as time, resources, people are key. And understanding this as your constraints will help you to, de to define what is the right process, what are the right uh, opportunities for engaging stakeholders. If you don't have much time, probably the, the stakeholder management that uh, Duncan highlighted is key, like it is sometimes unnecessary. But if you have the time or you are focusing on learning, making that learning as a comprehensive, as you know, a integrative as possible is demanding. So really it's around this situation, but in those cases to take the decision, the key is to go back to the basics. What is the time, what are the resources, what are the people and what you want to achieve and then uh, work backwards. Thank you, Braulio. With that, um, I want to give a huge thank you to everyone who signed on uh, tonight. 
for the webinar. And I also want to give a huge thank you to our speakers. So to Kathy, to Duncan, to, to Mahesh, thank you so much. And thank you to Braulio, as well as the number of uh, GRCN folks um, who helped produce the, the toolkit, to Luciana, Alvaro, Alex, Caroline in particular, who did a lot of hard work to, to get that toolkit and put it online. So I want to um, really emphasize that this is a moment in the Cities for Resilient Recovery discussion. So three things. One, about resources. So all of the resources that you heard about tonight, including the Toolkit for Resilient Recovery, are live on the Cities for Resilient Recovery website now, so you can access those. The second is about advice. There were a number of questions about how to stay connected, so please do go online, send us a note and an email about specific uh, tools work that you're interested in pursuing. As you heard this evening, there are partners um, here online who, who do want to help and continue that conversation with you. And third is about community. So the, the, the real, I think, value add of, of the Cities for Resilient Recovery initiative is that we are a community, we're a live practitioner community, and we will keep the discussion going. Um, so stay connected, stay active, and stay vocal so that we can keep the resources that we develop responsive to city needs. Um, and with that, I do have to say we are back online at 9 a.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. tomorrow with the next community event, which is about water, sanitation, and hygiene, which continues the Cities on the Front Line uh, series with the World Bank. So please do join us tomorrow. If you haven't registered already, there's still time. Um, and again, thank you to everyone for making the time to be with us tonight. Um, and until tomorrow, uh, good night or good afternoon or good day. Um, stay healthy and stay safe. Goodbye from Singapore. <laughs>